What's going on? It's Danny Drew here. Hope you're doing amazing. Hope you're doing well. We are back for another strategy lesson video. If you want to learn the placement strategy that is sneakily crushing you versus the pros, and you haven't watched the first video, then make sure to go check out how to place like a pro. That's in the description. Let's get into the video today. I want to quickly talk to you about progression, how people generally, from what I've seen as a player, as a student of the game, as somebody who also coaches and teaches other players, the general progression that most players go through. And it goes something similar to this. You play Catan with some friends, maybe you get invited over for a game night, and you get smashed. You don't know what you're doing, you're dropping pointless roads, you have no concept or clue how to get to 10 points. So you say, okay, if I want to continue to play, my next logical step is I need to get some reps in, I'll go online. So you find CU, you find colonist, whatever it is, but then you get smashed again. You're like, oh, okay, there, there's clearly better players that are playing online. So then the next logical step is you go to YouTube to learn. You type in Catan strategy, Catan tips and tricks. You find uh, a charming bald guy named Danny Drew or maybe Delighted, and you learn some basic understandings that there is something called Orweed Sheep. This is what we call the noob killer. And you learn the power of development cards. Then you go back to online and you test it out and you get your first taste of success. You pop a bunch of knights and and monos and VPs, you win the game. And that will actually take you pretty far, kind of mastering the nuances of Orby Sheep. You hit a ceiling in terms of your progress, your ELO, then you go back and you learn some road strategies, and then you hit another ceiling. A lot of players kind of go through this similar progression. And to be fair, you can actually go pretty high up the ELO ranks on a site like Colonist by simply learning some basics of Orweed Sheep and road strategies. That's all well and good. What this progression usually means for a lot of players is that you are going to develop in a way where you will be kind of putting yourself into different tiers. So if you're just in the starting phases of learning Orweed Sheep, you're dealing with certain challenges and certain understandings versus if someone's been playing Orweed Sheep for, let's say, five to six months, they're in a different tier of skill and understanding of the game. All this sounds simple. This introduces a whole new concept that I want to bring with you today, which is the idea of what we call leveling. Now, I didn't coin this term. This is actually coming from the poker community. So if anyone has played poker before and, and kind of studied, then you know that leveling is a pretty common strategic concept. Really, the concept is, is pretty simple. When you are doing any kind of skill-based activity, you will be in a particular tier or level of skill and ability. And depending on that tier, you will exhibit certain patterns, certain behaviors, and from the standpoint of playing against other people, certain exploits. So why is this relevant? As somebody who has been through more or less all the levels and, and continuing to keep learning and refining my game, I'm able to understand which level I'm playing against. And what I can do is I can use that in my own game and my own strategy to further my position. We'll get into that. We'll discuss this. But as just a concept within the Catan community, I really want to bring leveling and really the fact that every level has its devil. If you're a new player, you have certain things that you're dealing with. If you're an intermediate player, there's certain challenges and opportunities that are available to you. And of course, if you're an advanced player, there's still a whole new set of challenges and things that you can work on. And a good rule of thumb is that the players that are one to two levels above you can consistently beat you because they know what your tendencies are. But once you go, let's say, a level above you, you're going to get outplayed. And I find that a very fascinating, underappreciated aspect of playing a game like Catan. Now, this brings me to an interesting point. For most players, when they get into that early level of learning Orweed Sheep, the reality is, is that anyone can play a good Orweed Sheep setup, they can roll well, they can pull devs, and they can win a Catan game. I think this is probably one of the first kind of big insights for most players is once they start Orweed Sheep and they get used to pulling development cards, they get a feel for it, and it becomes that like adrenaline rush of playing a dominant Orweed Sheep game. We've all been there anyone who's played more than, let's say, 30 to 40 games. And we've also known that when we're choosing our positions and we are OWS-minded, then spots like this immediately stand out. How often is it when you pick the spot, let's say, in first pick, that you might get somebody in chat that says, oh, GG, dandy, or GG, sir, nice spot. We know these spots are strong, 
And it doesn't take us very long to know that this is kind of a go-to choice. It's obvious. It's ideal. But the crux of today's video is what happens when the setup isn't obvious or isn't ideal or when the pick isn't obvious or ideal. And that's really kind of what we want to explore today is how do you navigate that? Because I find this is actually one of the biggest leveling challenges for a lot of players who learn the basics of Road and OWS is when it's obvious, fine. They'll, you can play the setup, you can do the basics, and you can win games. But when it's not obvious, you, a lot of players tend to struggle, and it causes a lot of challenges. So let's really quickly go back to some basics here and just discuss the four ways that you can obtain a resource, you can get a resource. The most obvious is that you can place on it and you can roll it. I'm on the eight sheep, eight rolls, sheep enters my hand. Perfect. You could roll a seven and you could steal it. This player has a ton of one particular resource. You go, you place the robber on their hex and you take it out of their hand. These are probably the two most basic ways that newer players tend to deal with getting a certain resource that they need. Now, the next two I would say are kind of a leveling up aspect of as you're getting better, you learn to appreciate these things a little bit more, which is you can trade. And there's a whole different strategy mechanism of how you trade and you can trade strategically and smart. And then the last is you can port for it. Maybe you've got a bunch of sheep in your hand and you want wheat, you can four for one. Or if you have a two one port or a three one port, you can use that. The last one is very, very underappreciated from my experience. And what I find is when you can combine particular setups with a good port strategy, and it doesn't necessarily have to be two for one, it could be three for one, you're able to deal with those setups that aren't ideal on the surface or obvious. Let's get into that and I'll explain. What I call these are pseudo setups. Some people might say, oh, they're hybrids of your basic or wheat sheep or your road game, but I don't necessarily look at it that way because a lot of players won't see the board the same way that you will if you understand this concept and it becomes extremely powerful. So as an example, let's say you can pick up good weed and sheep, but you're lacking the ore. Well, what you can do is you can grab a bunch of wood or brick, hit a port and turn that wood and brick into potential ore to buy devs. That's one particular strategy. So the wheat, sheep, wood is an actual kind of like hidden setup that a lot of really good players know and use. Same thing if you get the ore and the wheat, but maybe you don't have the sheep, you can do kind of the same thing with the wood and brick and then port that for sheep for devs. That's another particular strategy. It's also another pseudo setup. The next one is more catered towards roads. And I wouldn't recommend this being kind of a focus because I really think at the lower levels, Development cards are very strong and very underappreciated, but you could go for wood and brick and then pick up, let's say, wheat and play more of a, a pseudo road game, drop a lot of settlements, try to build that first city, which is always the toughest. These are your three, what I would say, pseudo hybrid setups. All this is good. Let's actually get into some concrete examples. And for really the premise of this video, I want to focus on the wheat, sheep, plus wood brick. I would say this is probably one of my favorite hybrid setups and also extremely extremely powerful. Okay, so we have a board here. You should be able to see this. You should be able to take it in. And it's kind of playing off the first video. Never forget the rules of production and flexibility. That's always going to be the key. Now, how we interpret flexibility, though, is going to be depending on the level that you're in. So what do you do here in fourth? If you want to pause the video, I would recommend you do that. Let me discuss a little bit about what I see and what I think potentially could happen here. Going back to the first video, remember we talked about kind of marking those high production spots. So immediately my eye see the 6911, 694, 539, 548, and then maybe the 8210. Maybe as a second spot to pick up the ore. That could work for sure. I calculated this board and I think what I came up with is it was actually very, very interesting and probably not so intuitive on the surface, but when you get into why, it becomes extremely insightful. So again, pause the video if you need to. I'm gonna show you what I did here. I picked the 548, so triple sheep, and the 539. Now, this is what I would call primarily that wheat sheep wood setup with just a little bit of ore. Clearly, I should expect my hand to be mostly sheep because if you look at the pips here, I have four pips of wheat, four pips of wood on the five and the nine. I have two pips of the ore on the three, and then I have 12 pips of sheep. A lot of people, when they look at the setup, says, well, Drew, it's way too much sheep. And I would agree with you. As of right now, as this setup stands, it is a lot of sheep. But I'm not looking to have this setup play out this way. I actually look at it a little bit differently 
And I want to show you kind of my vision for this setup and why this can actually be really effective in terms of playing a development card game. So the first thing is I want to break down, again, we know the wheat is four pips, the wood is four pips, but I want you to isolate the five, the five sheet for a second, okay? The five is also four pips, so I'm counting the five as a four pip resource. Then I have that two pips of ore. Clearly, the lacking resource here is the ore. I need more ore to balance my setup to play more development cards. When I'm looking at this, I'm actually looking at all this additional sheep as a porting resource. And especially after I road settle on the 531, I get an additional five sheep plus the 3 1 flexibility on the 4 and the 8. So we're going to have that original five be four pips. We see that for sure. And then we have the eight, the four, and then the additional settle on the five be 12 pips of sheep with a three one essentially becomes four flexible pips of resources. So when you go and think about your setup and how you want to build it and how you want to use ports, what I see is that with the three one port, which probably wouldn't take me too long to get, that I could actually use all the flexible sheep plus the two ore from the three to actually have six pips of ore production by using that port strategy. I played this game and I dominated army on this board for the very fact that I was able to use all this excess sheep as kind of this pseudo or wheat sheep development card game. But you have to be able to see these kind of setups, you have to kind of look maybe one step further and say, okay, if I get a port and I use that effectively, how does it affect my middle to late game? So hopefully that gets your brain thinking just a little bit. So now we're going to look at another board. I posted this on my community post a day or two ago, and I was asking everyone, I'm in the third position here. First took the 6511, second took the 6411, a lot of ore <laughs> for blue here. And also an interesting thing to note is that this was played around 1600 ELO. 16, 1630 ELO, around that you know early 1600s. I'll bring the board up here on a slightly bigger screen. What makes the most sense for you here? Pause if you need to, kind of do some calculations, see what you can come up with. Now, what was interesting was that majority of the people that responded to my community post, there was really two main options. Out of the 26 responses, 80% of you said 843 or some kind of derivative of the sheep port. And I think that's a very reasonable pick. There was four of you that said the 693. And as those who know me know, the 693 is one of my favorite settles. And then there was one brave soul that said the 5910. We have to protect this man at all costs. Clearly, he is exploring new territory that most of us are not. But the point is, is that there was a consensus that the 843 was probably the best pick. Now, when I did my calculations on this board, I kind of came to the same conclusions that there was really two main spots that I need to look at, the 843 and the 693. As we've done in our previous lesson, we did the calculations, and I started with the 843. This looked like the most obvious to me. It's three unique resources. I get that little touch of brick, and I think my outs are pretty decent. I think I'll be able to get on the weed on the way back. So if you do the calculations, I take the 843 here, and then I see that orange most likely takes some kind of situation similar to this. Right? They're going to take the wood and the sheep. They're going to take the 692, most likely starting with the brick so they can go somewhere. Who knows? Maybe they might point down to the left. They might point up to the 5-2 to pick up the additional brick. This gave me, I think, very comfortably the 9411. This looks pretty good. I have all five resources. I have the sheep port in my back pocket or the 810 potentially. But there's something I didn't like about this, which was that if you look a level deeper, you notice the 6-3 is open for black. You notice the 5 9, 10 is open for blue or, or even 6-3 for blue. I didn't like the fact that though I have all five resources, I don't really have a lot of tradeability. I don't have a lot of wheat to trade. The wood's not that good because the, there's no real brick on this board. And for whatever reason, there's no guarantee I'll get the sheep port. I think I will, but you never know what could happen, right? It's a big risk. Maybe Blue might get a road builder a year of plenty and just absolutely smash me there. So I didn't really see there being a lot of real power behind the setup. And especially if Black gets like the 6-3 to 8-3, this maneuver here with the wood port, it feels like I'm probably going to get destroyed on the 4. I'm going to get destroyed on the 9. I just didn't like what this offered me. This brings me to the next point. 
which is we mentioned earlier leveling this idea that at different levels you're dealing with different devils different challenges different tendencies let's kind of look a little bit deeper at that so leveling at 1600 these are just by the way generalizations this is not set in stone i'm just kind of giving you where my mind went when I looked at this board. So as an example, players in this range tend to be more offensively driven, which means a few different things. First of all, they tend to be more carefree when trading, which means generally I can get a lot more two for ones, potentially trading for rare cards. Players also are less likely to early solo block. A lot of players tend to just diplomatically block two players. Another big one is that these players tend to lack knowledge on how to value hybrid setups. We all know if we see that 695, it's very likely that player is going to get blocked early because everybody knows how strong straight up or weed sheep is. And the last thing I would say is there are still a lot of placement mistakes that happen at this particular range. Even though these players, I would say, are, are certainly proficient at the game, they're learning setups and they know how to play potential winning setups, they still make placement mistakes that really imbalance the board, usually out of their favor. So when you take this into account and you see the board that's in front of you, it actually changed my mind a little bit. I decided to go actually for the 693 here. What you find is that fourth takes the setup that I previously picked. I think this is the most logical setup given the 843's potential. But now I get to play that wood, sheep, wheat hybrid. 8104. Now if you look at this, you can see that there's actually it's not very easy for blue and black to get a lot of wheat. Certainly the 6-2 is open, 6-2 to 5-2, I think that's actually pretty good. I think one of the challenges here is that they are going to be starved for wheat on some level. Somebody is going to be starved for wheat and full of ore, which for me, at this level where I know I can hustle trades, I can get good deals, and I also control a lot of space. Like It's also difficult to block me. You block the 9, well, I have the 6 and the 3. You block the 4, well, I have the 8. So I really liked the potential and the leveling opportunities this setup has on this particular board against these particular players. So here's the actual screenshot from the game. So you can see, as predicted, it worked out very well. Now, Orange did point to the 810. I thought this was an interesting play. Not bad. I, I don't hate it. I think the sheep port is not the end-all be-all. 810 is very good here for them. Uh, they can definitely start to churn some of this wood a little bit. But I got the setup that I wanted. Blue goes all in on the sheep, hoping to get the sheep port now. And I think this is a pretty good option, a little bit slow though. And again, remember, I told you, they're going to be dependent on a lot of early game trades to get some of the wheat, and I'm going to definitely be the driver of those trades. And then Black, talking about placement mistakes, 8-10 was played. Ugh. I think 6-2 to 5-2 is much better, right? You just get a little bit more of a complete game, but they didn't choose it. They end up going wheatless, which actually made my setup even stronger Ultimately, what you see here is I have a ton of wheat, which I can take to a 3-1 port. I have a bunch of wood, which plays off the 3-1 and the wood port really nicely. Even though I don't have a lot of sheep, there is a ton of sheep on this board with blue and also a ton of ore with blue as well and black. I think this is a great setup. Now, I will post this game in the near future, so I don't want to give you away too much. But I will tell you this. I know intuitively that this board gives me a lot of tradability in the early game, which if you know what you're doing, if you can outplay those lower levels, you can take advantage of those trades and those port plays to really accelerate your game. A certain aspect of this game is is really having the awareness to know who your opponents are, to know what value different positions have, and to really just try to get a good port and good production. You don't need or wheat sheep to buy devs. You can supplement your resources in different ways to get the setup that you need. So I just want you to think a little bit more strategically. In this game, I crushed army absolutely annihilated army here even though i don't have the best sheep and i have zero ore and it's because i was able to effectively produce the resources through my trades and my ports and playing the board effectively remember go back to kind of the math of your setup find what are ways that you can get the resources that you don't produce through trading and or porting you know the takeaway for this lesson is to still look for those creative opportunities and get the setup that you need. I hope this was helpful. There's a lot of ways that you can build the setups and play this game effectively, and it makes it very exciting. I will be honest with you, a lot of the players that are just getting started will not be able to see the power of your setup until it's too late. All right, I appreciate you being here, spending your time with me. I want you to go out there this week, absolutely crush it. You stay great, and I'll see you 
very soon. Thanks.